Hello and welcome to episode three of the Poolside Pass podcast. Today I'm joined by Ryan Livingston, head coach at Newcastle Swim Team. Um, Ryan's been here about four or five years and been producing junior uh, international athletes as well as a couple of senior international athletes as well. Um, so Ryan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks Jamie. I uh, appreciate the uh, opportunity to come on and, uh, and talk. Cool. Um, Let's start with just a little bit of your background in the sport and uh, in coaching. So where it all started for you and what have you been involved with so far in your career? So I was a competitive swimmer like uh, like most coaches. Um, I swam seriously until I was around 18 and then during uh, during university I, I, uh, I swam a little bit as, as part of books teams and things like that. But certainly by that point, studying sports science, um, I was ready to, to transition into coaching. Um, I started my coaching career way back when I was 16, sort of swimming, teaching and, and coaching very young young swimmers within the club setup. Um, I started full-time coaching in 2007 uh, after leaving university. So my first role was as a community sports coach, which was a part-funded role between the local authority, Sport England, uh, and the swimming club, which was Richmond Dales, my, my home club. Um, I was at Richmond for seven years. And during that period of time, uh, I was head coach of the club, uh, coaching athletes up to, to national medalist standard, but mostly age or, or youth athletes. Um, but also as part of my community sports coach role, I was required to coach, uh, or rather teach within the Learn to Swim setup. Uh, I did adult lessons, children's lessons, uh, one-to-ones, uh, mini polo, uh, triathlon coaching. Um, and then I also got involved with, with pool programming, um, and various other event organisation. Now, whilst my passion was always coaching, um, I didn't really have a great passion for many of those other things. I think it did give me a, a well-rounded background and education in the sport. Cool. So, you say when you when you started started coaching, you were working with kind of a really broad range, but um, kind of did a lot of work with with young and, yeah. and age group athletes. So that's going to be kind of the the main topic for today's podcast. Uh, we're going to be looking at considerations for. For age group swimming, um, so why don't we start um, just to clear up any any doubts people have? Uh, let's let's just define an age group swimmer because I know there is there are a number of kind of age yeah. groups banded around. So, well, if we assume that the, the age group of, of nine to fourteen could be defined as an age group swimmer, like throughout the conversation, we can obviously discuss uh, how that impacts both youth swimming, that being fifteen or, or over, or even even senior swimming. Um, certainly, I think if we, if we look at age group swimming as being that sort of 10 to 14 age group bracket as you transition out of learn to swim or, or very uh, preliminary coaching programs and then going into, into to youth age swimming at 15 plus. Um, from my point of view, that would be considered to be age group swimming. Cool. So, as we've already highlighted, you, you kind of started out coaching age group swimmers. What, um, what's your philosophy in terms of coaching your age group swimmers and did this change from kind of when you started coaching age group swimmers to kind of when you finished with, with working with age group swimmers? Um, I don't think my philosophy has changed, in fact it hasn't. Uh, I had a very good mentor, uh, he was my coach, a guy called Keith Atwood, who was head coach at Richmond Dales when I was there um, and he was very, very good in, in terms of mentoring me. Obviously at, at university I did sports science so we'd, we'd touched on long term athlete development and which was quite popular at the time. Um, but certainly my philosophy is from a, from a training content point of view, um, it has to be technique driven, um, medley focused, kick focused, um, and then little bits of speed work. Um, if we're talking energy systems, more a lactic as opposed to anything anaerobic, but certainly some speed work right from the beginning, starts, turns, finishes. And from a training content point of view, I think if you can cover all of those bases, um, and I think if you can coach it well, I think you've got your swimmers set up for um, for a good future in the sport. Cool. Um, so often you see you see some coaches trying to trying to superimpose uh, a senior program on, onto age group swimmers. Um, how would the way you set up an age group program differ to how you currently set up your your senior program? I think as an age group coach, um, what you have to remember is. You have to be a technique expert. And again, we haven't really talked around coaching practice or communication at this point, but in terms of training content, 
Um, as an age group coach, your speciality should be technique. Um, you don't need to be a physiologist or a periodization, an ex uh, expert in periodization. Now you can be those things because you might need them later in your career. And certainly that's what I did. I concurrently learned about things whilst coaching age groupers. Um, but certainly the priority as an age group coach is to be a technique coach above sure. everything else. Um, it's a thankless task in, in many ways <laughs> as an age group coach because um, if you do your job correctly, you're not gonna see the results of your work until a time where those athletes are no longer swimming with you. Yeah. Um, and I think as an age group coach, it's important to understand that. Um, I do various presenting uh, at conferences and clinics around and, and I, th I have somewhat of a reputation as being fairly honest and, and I will be quite honest. And if there are any age group coaches listening, um, my advice would be that nobody is looking at you seeing you coaching a really fast 12 year old and thinking that you're the best coach in the world <laughs> you know that, yeah. that is the reality of the situation like nobody's looking at that and thinking oh you definitely need to be doing something else now as a young age group coach when I was doing that I did really struggle with it at times because I thought what I was doing was the right thing we were doing technique driven programs but my athletes were getting beaten you know we'd go to county championships and we'd get beaten by other age group athletes um, and I wasn't sure if I was doing the right thing because my athletes were getting beaten, but then some years down the line, those, those athletes that I, that I got at 12 and 13, um, some of them transitioned into seniors and, and moved on to different programs. Um, some of them ended up as national finalists, national medalists. And so I think over the period of the, the five to seven years, you know, where I was at Richmond Dales, I think I did see the, the benefits of doing that. Um, but certainly as an Asian coach, it can be really, really hard, especially like yourself, if you've done sports science, you, you, you're well trained in, in the different sports science disciplines and knowledgeable, yet at the end of the day, you've got to deliver an age group program, um, which can feel quite limited at times. Of course, of course. Um, so obviously when we're coaching age group swimmers, we have to appreciate the fact that um, each individual will be at a different kind of phase in their, in their growth and development. Yeah. And in some essences, that's, that's kind of art of, of, of age group coaching, is you're coaching often big groups, but every individual's somewhere different yeah. in, in their own development. How do you, or ha how did you manage this to deliver the best program to each individual within a group? So I'll, I'll talk about our situation at Newcastle right now. Um, in, a, in a club our size, and we, we are a big club, it's reasonably easy because we might have five or six squads that cater for swimmers between 10 and 14 years of age. So it's reasonably easy to align the swimmer to the correct squad based on what we think they need in terms of training content, in terms of how many sessions they need to do a week. And obviously within your group, you can also individualize that a little bit further in terms of sessions. If you've got seven sessions available, for example, not everybody needs to do that. Um, going back to, to Richmond Dales, um, at any given time, you know, I might have in the top group, I could have swimmers aged between um, maybe 12 if they were, they were very early maturers or um, are quite competent at that age and that could go right through until maybe 18 years of age before they went on to university. Um, and I think you just need to become very, very good at planning if you're in that situation. Um, you need to utilize uh, your lane space really well. Um, the training sessions and training sets don't need to be the same for each individual in the squad. Um, so in terms of training content, that should be different. Again, like I said, you might um, have different number of sessions for different swimmers. You might have nine available, but some of them might only be doing six. So I think in terms of individualization, I think it's just about managing your space, your environment and your resources as best as you possibly can. Um, now you, you visited our session this morning and you saw the way I set up even for what is a older youth and senior group, I still take that individualization process very seriously. I think it's really, really important. Um, so I think if you can learn to manage your space um, and your lanes really, really well, I think it is possible to, to cater for different for athletes at different stages of their development, um, but within one squad. Do you not feel sometimes, um, especially, you know, yes, you do that in, in, in your senior group and you've got, you've not got a, a huge, huge group like, like some age yeah. group coaches would have. Do you not feel that sometimes they might run the risk of, of spreading themselves too thinly around in, in their group? Yeah, so if you're a, a big program, a fairly big program, like what, what we're both in, the, the athletes in most squads are kind of fairly common goals. Uh, it's probably the smaller club programs where that becomes, um, becomes more of an issue. 
but ultimately if you've got you know three lanes and, and 20 athletes which is probably quite a common thing to have I think you know you can run three different sets um, I think it comes down to your ability to plan and your ability to manage um, and so I think there's, there's really no excuse for, for providing athletes with the same training content when they are at different stages of their development but within the same squad I think it is possible to do it cool totally agree with that as, as a coach when, when you're sitting down now as, as head coach of this programme and you sit down with other coaches and, and you review swim and movement th- through squads yeah. what are kind of the key things you look for in uh, a great age group swimmer yeah. to potentially move them through the programme what are your non-negotiables yeah. um, what you need to consider then when, yeah. when, when you're moving them through so we have an internal squad movement criteria so within each squad or to enter into each squad we've got a an endurance or aerobic capacity test there's a kick test in there um, and then there's various stroke efficiency tests on the different strokes which might be perform a number of repeats off a given turnaround time with for example six dolphin kicks off the wall and holding a, a, a predetermined stroke count per length so within that squad criteria it already manages that squad move process because we need to make sure that the athletes can do that sort of thing but the theme would effectively be it would be endurance focused so we want them to be proficient in, in, in endurance swimming um, not just being able to do the endurance work but being able to do it with stroke efficiency as well I think it's really important Absolutely. we do a lot of stroke counting on all four strokes um, we do a lot of dolphin kick counts or distances off the wall um, and kick is a big part of the programme um, during that age group part of the uh, part of the club so at any given time um, certainly between those ages and 10 and 14 um, kick could account for between 25 and 35 percent of the overall program um, and i really like kicking because you can condition swimmers on kick um, mm-hmm. yeah and i think you don't get the same technique breakdown that you might get as if you were trying to do large volumes or large frequency of swimming so i really think from an aerobic capacity development point of view um, i think kick can be really really valuable and should be a big part of every every age group program um, and I think if you you know we had a discussion earlier about kick being a big part yeah. of both you know Newcastle and Birmingham but I think if you go around the, the bigger more successful clubs in the UK I think you would find that kick is is probably something that's valued by by a lot of those programs you, you never see a swimmer at an elite level who can't kick towards the back end of a race no. you know, no. they've all got an outboard motor coming down the second the, the last 50 yeah um, and I just in terms of like underwater kicking as well obviously has a, has a huge impact on the sport nowadays um, I think in terms of maintenance of body position I think if you've got a strong leg kick I think that's going to really help and if you're like you say if your legs fall apart in the, the last quarter of a 100, 200 or a 400 metre event like you are done you know I think it's game uh, over <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's over so I think um yeah, kick something we really do value, do value quite a lot. So, so moving on from kind of the, the pool-based program you provide to, to age group swimmers, um, there's lots of ideas and myths floating around about what you should be delivering strength and conditioning-wise to, to age group swimmers. Some people think um, you can externally load them. Some people are completely against it and they only work with with body weight work what's your what's your stance stance on this and, and what would you suggest so I'm a big advocate advocate of it first of all I think it's really really important um, not just from a physical preparation or strength and conditioning point of view but I think a well rounded athletic development um, through multi sport or exposure to multi sports is really really important up until that, that 11 to 14 years age um, my general guidance if I'm asked this question is is multi-sport until kind of 12 to 13 years of age and then drop one sport per year so that by the time you get to 17 or 18 then you're probably able to specialise like fully fully in swimming. Um, that's not to say we don't allow other athletes at that level to do other sports if it's something they really enjoy and if they really value but you know if you're trying to make a European junior team or a world junior team or a, or a senior team at 17 and 18 years of age then you, you're probably not going to be doing any other sports at the time yeah. yeah so 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 multi-sport really really important for me uh, and one thing in swimming I, I know we have things like arena league and junior leagues and things like that but it is quite an individual sport and I think we do miss the the team uh, ethos a little bit in swimming um, so I think participation in, in some team sports where there is a, a 
common goal um, it's quite good just from a social and emotional development point of view as well um, but in terms of S&C and, and land work uh, UK SCA uh, NSCA Australian Strength and Condition Association um, British Association of Sport and Exercise Sciences they all have position stands um, and guidance notes on strength and conditioning or physical preparation activity um, in terms of or its relation to youth development um, so the information is out there it's, it's well researched it's a really well researched topic now um, I think it's ignorance frankly to say that it's it's harmful if it's done in a controlled environment um, where it's supervised by a, a a competent and qualified coach, um, then I think you, you have to be doing strength and conditioning or, or some level of, of physical preparation at a young age. Uh, in terms of training content, I think it's it's really important, same as swimming, I think you need to get the technique foundation. Mm -hmm. So for me that is making sure we hit, hit the five movement patterns, um, being hinge, squat, press, pull, and then uh, multi-movements, so some combination of those. Um, I think groundwork, so crawling type, type exercises from a movement point of view is really, really valuable. Um, mobility and, and obviously core work as well. Um, in terms of external loading, it's not about an age thing, it's about when the athlete is ready. So you're of the opinion that once they've learned the basics and, and, and the movement patterns, yeah. once they're proficient in that, yeah. then you can slowly start to, so. to, to build yeah. up. Yeah, I mean, and things like lower body work, so squats, for example, like doing body weight squats, once you've become proficient in that movement pattern, like it, your own body weight becomes quite a, a minimal stimulus after a while. I don't think doing massive high rep squat, body weight squat workouts is going to really bring around any adaptation. So I think, you know, to load with a, a light med ball or kettlebell or, or dumbbell and perform some, some goblet squat movements. Um, at quite a young age, it's, it's totally, it's not just totally acceptable, it's, uh, it's the right thing to do. Um, but yeah, it's not about an age, it's about, you know, when the athlete's ready, you know, then we can externally load the athlete. But I'll just come back to the point I made earlier, it's all about, it's got to be delivered properly, it's got to be delivered by somebody that's competent and qualified um, and, and able to deliver a, a successful SNC programme for age group swimmers. So what, what would your advice be to coaches who are in programs where they don't have access to a, a fully qualified SNC yeah. professional? How can they still provide quality uh, land work for, for their well, swimmers? First of all, they need to be careful um, just to cover themselves. They should not be delivering anything that is beyond their competency. So providing it's something that's been covered in their, their coaching education, either level one or, or level two or level three or whatever it is they've got. Um, if it's covered in there, um, then fine, deliver it. But if they have any, um, if they have any concern, um, then I wouldn't deliver it. Um, now this, this raises another, another point in that there are programs in every locality that can deliver this for you. So it comes down to what your club is about and what the aims of your club are. So if you can't provide an SNC coach, then maybe it's time to, to move the athlete onto a different programme. In the same way that you would move an athlete on if they can't access the right number of sessions or, or training content that was that was uh, specific enough for them. Um, on a slightly different point, there is a there's a big issue in the UK swimming at the moment where I feel like everyone has to be a performance programme or call themselves a performance programme. And this S and C provision really does does dovetail into that. Um, you know, clubs aren't performance programs if they haven't produced senior international athletes or at least junior international athletes in recent years. So calling yourself a performance program, then not producing performance results, um, is not really acceptable in my opinion. And I think the S and C thing we have we have clubs local to us that don't work with S and C coaches, but claim they are a performance program, which which they're not. So, to coming back to your original question, like I said, don't deliver anything that's outside your competency. Um, keep yourself protected in terms of what you're delivering so there's no risk of, of injury or, or any issues for yourself. Um, but ultimately, what you have to understand as an age group coach is, if you're not able to deliver the training that's required, then it's time to move the athlete on, whether that be in land um, or in the pool. Cool. So, we've kind of covered 
pool content, we've covered land content. I just want to spend a little bit of time now talking about um, the the actual art and, and the practice of of coaching. Yeah. Um, in your opinion, and with the experience you've got um, and your, your background in coaching, how is actually coaching an age group swimmer now? Is it is it any different to what it would be coaching an age group swimmer five or ten years ten years ago? Um, I think it is a little different. I mean, I, we get told it's massively different with with Generation Z and, and that kind of thing. Um, I think ultimately now it really does come down to credibility as well because not only swimmers but, but parents have a lot of information at their fingertips now. So I think as a coach you need to make sure that you are you are, you are one step ahead of them or, or many steps ahead of them, it would be better. So I think you need to be credible in what you're doing. I think I think athletes will or, or young swimmers will, will do the, the training or the work that you ask them um, if you're able to justify you know, why you're doing it. Um, it. It might have been acceptable 10 or 15 years ago to just ask a swimmer to do a big aerobic set and, and not really explain too much why that was, but I think nowadays that isn't going to work. So if you're able to justify the benefits of doing that um, and communicate that message effectively, I think, yes, we can get the, the swimmers to do the same work and the work that is required. Uh, having said that, I think in terms of our communication strategies, I think... Um, Certainly from a technique point of view, the, a lot of young children nowadays are very visual in their learning because yeah. obviously smartphones, tablets, um, you know, at school, I guess, it's, I guess they're using those sort of methods as well to, to deliver their message there. So I think visual learning is really, really important. I think video analysis or, or video demonstrations are going to be really, really useful. Um, and I think you need to keep your message concise. I think we need to be very, very... Uh, clear, very, very concise, and and very, very short in our delivery of our delivery of messages to those athletes because I don't think rambling on a, over a matter of minutes is going to be going to be useful for them. I think we need to get the message to them quickly because that's what they're used to that that instant um, instant feedback. But as I said, I think being credible goes a long, long way. Um, I think. Communicating with parents has, has changed a little bit. Mm -hmm, I agree. Um, I mean, I've, I'm, I'm 33. I've only been coaching full time for 12 years, um, and so I'm sure there are coaches that are a lot more experienced than me going back even further. Um, but in, but parents seem to be um, fearful or, or even terrified of of their child failing mm -hmm. um, or experiencing any kind of disappointment or hardship. And I'm certainly of the opinion that not only is failure to be expected, but actually it's, it's necessary in the long term. Yeah. So I think it's really important as a coach that you communicate with your parents, um, have them come in for squad meetings, explain um, the process of age group and indeed youth and seniors swimming, that, that it's not always going to be PBs every week and every time they swim and they may have to go through a plateau, they may regress. Um, there may be certain instances where growth and development causes either rapid improvement or in some cases regression um, and that everyone's got an individual path in the sport so yeah I think I think children have changed a little bit but I'll, actually I think it's it's the parents that have changed a little bit more um, the big issue we have in our in our club is, is squad moves this this mass hysteria around who's going to get moved up and who isn't and when it's happening and um, and I think uh, and I think that really sums up the, the point I've just made that actually if we just communicate with parents and, and try to inform them a little bit better um, I think that works best uh, as a coach to then just moan about parents when you've, <laughs> you've made no attempt to actually communicate with them I think is uh, is unacceptable as well I agree I think um, often parents are in the coaching community parents are seen as the enemy yeah, like yeah. the people that put, put barriers um, in the way but I think, I think that's the wrong way to look at it I think we ought to look at parents as facilitators and people we ought to, to work yeah, with yeah. rather than what you against. have to remember about parents is what they think they're doing is what they think's best they're never acting out of malice okay most people don't act out of malice they, they act out of uh, being misinformed um, or out of concern it, it's never I mean coaches like like you say they put on this put on this bulletproof jacket and, and, and try to be very confrontational and I don't think you really need to be like that. I think it's, it works much easier if, if you communicate with parents a lot better. Um, you know, inform them of, like I said, all the things that could and couldn't affect their child's swimming and what might happen and what might not happen. Um, 
and I think that that really helps and I think that the days of just trying to avoid parents is is, is gone and it's slightly different for me because I only work with older athletes and I don't deal with parents at all so it's quite <laughs> easy for me to say that but, but by the same token I think that the parents of the, the swimmers in my school are very trusting of me and, and we just don't get any problems so you mentioned earlier on in that in that answer about Generation Z yeah. and us as coaches being told that coaching Generation Z is is like coaching a different species of animal compared to, to, to the previous generation. Um, what would be kind of what what are the key differences between a person of generation Z and a person who's who's not and where do the, the yeah. differences lie and what are your key kind of so points I'm, for that? I'm still coaching in, in, in my squad in particular um, people that would be considered millennials or, or back end of millennials so we're talking like a diff, the generation before uh, generation Z um, I think the concept of and I don't mean to tar everyone with the same brush but I think the concept of hard work and patience is not something that generation Z uh, individuals value um, you know the idea that um, you know you might have to work really hard for between five and ten years to really achieve your goal in swimming um, is a concept not one that they, they won't accept but one that they might not have been told because it doesn't happen very often in their well, lives they might have to get used to rather yeah, than so I think you need to kind of promote and educate on the idea of patience um, you know competitive sport um, isn't quick. There's, there's no quick fixes. Um, you know, when I was when I was you know very young, if, if I wanted to if I wanted to watch a new movie, for example, and I wasn't going to watch it at the cinema, it would require waiting until it came out on rental release, and then I would have to get a bus into the town centre and go to a video shop, and then hire this video, and then get the bus back home, and then put it in and. Whereas now you can, you know, these, these kids can get a video instantly that's been pirated and, and it's there instantly before it's even come out on release. And if you apply that logic to every area of their life, which is effectively what happens, to then tell them or to then expect them to understand that competitive sport's not like that, of course that's something they're going to struggle with. Um, so I think we need to, from a very young age, promote the idea that this is a long-term process. Um, with the parents and, and swimmers in our squads, when we've interacted with, with them in, in group settings or in group meetings, we always try to emphasise that at Newcastle Swim Team, um, we are about the long term. Now, we happen to win the Junior League this year, but it's the first year that we've done it, and normally we go there and we get beaten by other clubs. And it's, it's quite, at times it's been quite difficult for parents to see that and think, oh, well, they're better than us, are they doing a better job? Um, but ultimately we de de develop athletes over the long term. Like we're the ones that have had national, junior international and senior international level success because we've been a little bit more patient. Um, and that's quite an easy sell now because we have had athletes like Nick Pyle, who, who's been a European champion. We've had Emily Large, who's, who's swam at Commonwealth Games. Um, and then we have a number of senior athletes in the programme who compete well on a, on a national level. So it's quite easy now because of our role models. Um, and something, that I'm, that I'm quite proud of, I think we've done really well as a club, is we've taken athletes that weren't particularly good age group athletes, who have gone into, to have success at national or even international level in the case of some of the swimmers. Um, so it's not a difficult sell now because we, we have that, that role model aspect in the club. Cool. Do you find often for, for people that are, that are slightly older, a mobile phone is something they view as a tool to help them get tasks done whereas um, if, if you ask uh, a 13 year old yeah. to, to leave their phone at home yeah. um, it's it's like them going out without their shoes on yeah. uh, they, they can't do it yeah so for our generation um, I say our generation I'm quite a bit older than you but for our <laughs> generation um, it's exactly that it's a tool so I'm not going to say I don't use my phone a lot because I do but I use it to send emails, I use it to check uh, athlete monitoring, I might use it to make notes, but, but I use it as a tool. Um, I, I use it to listen to music or podcasts or whatever, but I, I use it and I think 
uh, the f- they see it as an extension of themselves. So it's actually like you say, it's part of them, and that's that's probably the difficulty for people our age or our generation to understand that actually it's really really important to them. Do you think the fact that they're so attached to their mobile phones um, lends itself to um, communication issues in terms of how how we coach them? Uh, yeah, I think it can do. Yeah, I think I think they become very very engrossed in this, and I think the art of the art of speech. Uh, our conversation is, is lost a little bit. So and earlier on I said we need to be very very concise and very clear about our message. So I think um, I think that's really, really important to, to just get the message across really, really quick and snappy because I think that's what we're going to respond to best. Um, you know, there may be ways where we could use multimedia and, and smartphones a little better. Like it might be that there's a distribution of a, a technique video that then they can, they can look at the phone and that kind of thing. Um, so I think there's probably ways we can use the devices um, because ultimately they are here and uh, you know they are here to stay. Um, so yeah, I totally agree with what you're saying. It's an extension of them, and I think we almost got to embrace that rather than see it as a barrier. Cool. So that kind of brings us to the, to, to the end of the, of the main topic. One thing I kind of want to finish on um, is kind of just ask you to sum up your, your five key considerations uh, for coaching age group swimmers, um, and just kind of explain a little bit about those. So I think, first and foremost, I think we want it to be fun and engaging. So we want the environment to be fun, we want them to be engaged, we want it to be interested, and we want a, a young child to want to come back to the set to the next session. Mm-hmm. Um, well, sometimes that can be quite challenging. It's, it's, it's reasonably easy at a, at a very young age, but I think when you get to that, you know, that 13, 14, 15 type age, you know, when maybe you're asking them to do more sessions, more volume, potentially longer uh, aerobic capacity based work, like it can become a little bit boring. So I think you need to, I think you need skills as a coach, um, you know, to be able to, to communicate, have conversations, have chats, be, be interested in the athletes themselves. Um, so I think you need to develop some skills in that regard. So ultimately, yeah, fun and engaging and, and somewhere where they, they feel safe and, and want to keep coming back to. I think that's you know, the most important thing. Um, from a training content point of view, um, as I said previously, you, you should be a technique coach first and mm-hmm. foremost. Yep. Um, technique is the limiting factor in most sports. It's certainly the limiting factor in swimming. So I think in your general week plan, I think we need to be hitting every stroke every week. Um, it might be in different proportions. There might be a specific focus, a focus on certain strokes in certain weeks, but ultimately I think we need to hit every stroke in every week. Um, so certainly it should be a, an IM-focused program. But also including starts, turns, finishes, and takeovers. Uh, and just a point on takeovers, you might not be in a position where you have relay teams in your club at the moment, but you know an athlete in your program might move on to swim somewhere else and, and relays might become a big focus it's certainly a big focus for national teams so i think um you know takeovers has to be included in there as well um from an uh, energy system ergogenesis or development point of view um aerobic capacity should be be the dominant uh, training modality um but technique is the priority so technique first and then endurance considerations afterwards um, should be predominantly low level you can get a lot of uh, cardiovascular capillarization um, adaptation in the mitochondria just from doing some very very extensive aerobic work that doesn't need to ex- exceed 50 beats below max and just become very very efficient uh, at swimming at those speeds as well um, I do think there should be some speed right through and there's loads of ways you can achieve this. You can achieve it with your HVOs over starts, turns, or finishes. Um, relays are a good way to do that in training. Um, and when I say speed, I refer to, to ATP, PC, or a lactic systems as opposed to anything predominantly anaerobic. Um, they are going to get some anaerobic stimulus just through racing. So if they race between 10 and 15 times a year, they're going to get a decent anaerobic stimulus there. And in my opinion, that's probably enough um, during the age group. Uh, age group part of the program. Um, as we touched on, kick, really, really important, can account for 25 to 35% of the program, should be done on all four strokes, underwater, um, some level of breath hold component might be important there for the, uh, 
with the underwater kick development. And uh, with kicking, um, you can be really creative. You can kick in different positions, um, you know, front, back, side, snorkels, no snorkels, boards, different types of flow. So there's loads of ways you can be creative with that. And then that ties into the aerobic capacity development because you really can use kick to get some aerobic capacity development with the age group swimmers. Um, and then finally, as we touched on before, uh, multi-sport and uh, physical preparation work to accompany the swimming programme. And in my opinion, from as early as you can really. There's, there's yep. no harm in doing some, some low level physical preparation work which could be in the form of, of games and that sort, sort of thing and probably should be with, with very young athletes. Cool. Well, Ryan, um, thank you for coming on the podcast. No problem. Um, it's been great to speak to you. Um, I hope anyone listening has, has found the conversation useful and, and take some things away to, to maybe apply to their own coaching. Um, thank you to the listeners for, for listening. Um, if you like the podcast, subscribe and pass it on to other coaches you know. Um, in the meantime, hope you hope you get on well with your, co- your coaching and, and apply what you've perhaps learnt from the podcast um, into your coaching. And I'll be back soon with episode four. Thank you.